from onward, here onward, how do we read the Lord's Word? How do we study it? It's got to change. So a few things that we need to uh, look, consider. That we must, we will study the Lord's Word with a great sense of purpose. Right? This was Psalm 119. Where the psalmist prayed, teach me that I may. Now you're going to see this phrase repeated. Revive me that I may. So did you experience a revival of heart and mind, of spirit in the camp? Then what next? We don't just study the Lord's Word, okay, because it's, okay, we just come. If you study anything for nothing, it comes out nothing. There must be a purpose, a reason, a and the purpose is that of the needs of the church, ministry. We need more people to, be, to know the Lord's Word that they may minister to, old and young. Would you be part of it? So a few people come up and say, so I want to be part of this chain. What, what do I do? Okay, first, here. God has got to be able to use you Right? It's not volunteer. I volunteer my time. But God has got to be, you've got to be equipped. You've got to know your staff. If not, how to be useful for the Lord. Right? And so that's a real challenge to those who are, you know, uh, you, know, you are young people, young adult. You can reach out to the younger ones in the church. Well, let it be a challenge. Okay, so I said to my 12.30 class, which is your 13, 14, 15-year-old, and then, uh, you know, eldest one day is actually, oldest one day is actually Amber, which is quite young. So I said to them, what stood out two weeks? Easter, family camp. And they all told me. They were just so uh, encouraged by the pastoral team. For the girls, Camille. One name, Camille. For the boys, uh, student pastors. You know, they, they reached out, they answered questions, we asked questions, and they explained the Lord's Word. We need to see that. See? Otherwise, we don't know how to share the Lord's Word with them. We're there, but we, what can you do? Okay, so this becomes a real great sense of, can this be your purpose? And so you come with a great sense of purpose. Lord, teach me that I may. That I may. What is that I may? That's Psalm 109. That's prayer. You combine prayer and this is what, 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 it is, what you want to look, look forward to, what you want to attempt. Okay? So the purpose is there. Right? Is there truly something that the Lord would give to you in ministry? Now, when I study the Lord's Word, okay, purpose, ministry. What is your ministry? Okay, so this is, it becomes, um, you don't just study. You study with a great sense of focus. You search for it. It will change the very way you study the Lord's Word. It's not just for yourself. Notice, the purpose is for my own. Okay, so I know a bit more Bible. What for? It's not just for self-gain. It is for others. That I may minister. That I may... That's the I may. Right? So this is something that we want to think about. So prayer meetings, same thing. Well, let's learn how to pray. So the question number 16, how to pray intercessory prayers? Well, first learn basic prayers. Before we talk about, let's, how do we understand prayers in ministry? The sons of Korah were all prayers for ministry. We will be reading another psalm of sons of Korah. How did they engage God in prayer? ministry for the sake of others. 
That's something to, to, to consider. Okay, so when we come, let's read the Lord's Word. Let's really ask, Lord, teach us that I may. That I may be a better servant. That I may be useful for you. That I may be well equipped. That I may be ready all the time. That as much as it is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel. That's got to take time. It's got to take discipline. It's got to take commitment. It's not going to happen overnight. But it's got to begin somewhere. Okay? This is what we want to look at for Bible study from here onwards. Like I say, with every camp, every time you learn the Lord's Word, it's one step forward. You cannot go back to, okay, I'll go back to my old ways of studying the Scriptures. You do that, you just backslide. It's just a camp wasted. That's how you grow. That's how I grow. With every cramp, okay, now it shaped the way I approach it now. Now, this way. I go this way. You go forward, you go onward, you go upward. You don't go backwards. Right? You change. And so you study it with a great sense of even intensity. You search, you look. So the new theme on the presence of God. Look all other texts, Genesis, Exodus, Psalm 16, Psalm 91, Psalm 68. We haven't even begun yet. You search to understand the doctrine of the presence of God. Right? So that becomes a personal commitment. See, reading becomes so much more enjoyable with so much more purpose rather than I just read Bible. Okay, I did my morning devotion. It just becomes a habit. It's not just forming a habit. You do it with a great sense of purpose. Okay? Well, this is what we hope to attempt. That would be wonderful. And then, it, then we would see the Word of God working effectively in our hearts, in our life. Otherwise, we can keep on reading, keep on studying, and then same, same approach, same thing, then no growth. That would be a crying shame. Okay, it's got to change. Okay, well, let's pray together. Our Father, we pray that we would learn how to progress in the way we read and study your word with purpose that we can serve you better. Lord, help us to be even more mindful of the needs of the church, the lack of people who are skilled and equipped to minister effectively. Lord, help us to respond, to rise up, to be people who will take on the call to be better equipped. Lord, we ask that you would bless us tonight as we study the Scriptures once again. We ask that you would bless. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, well, we're going to take up 1 Timothy, chapter 6 now, and we are going to read a couple of verses. Now, this is really interesting. Okay, now here is Paul equipping, instructing Timothy that he may minister better. Same thing with us. We've got to keep learning. Right? For what? That we may minister better to different people, to different needs. Okay? When we don't grow, when we don't learn, our field becomes more and more narrow. Look at Timothy. He's called to minister to young people, to older people, to the women folks, to the men folks, to the leaders, and even to bond servants. What are bond servants? This is a literal bond servant. Okay? Now, let's, let's read this. Okay, in 1 Timothy 6, and then we read in verse 1, let as many bond servants 
as under the yoke. Now, what is this bond servant? Okay. The bond servants, why are they called bond servants anyway? And then the word yoke, under the yoke. Right? They are literally slaves. Okay? Bit hard today, they're none. In the ancient times, they were common. Not that they're none now, but it is not common in society to own slaves. Okay? Slaves are not the same as servants. Not exactly the same. The slave can function as a servant. But what is a slave? A slave does not get paid. They are bought. They are owned by their masters. That's why you call a bond servant. They are under this yoke, bounded, as it were. Okay? And in the ancient times, this was common. Either they sold themselves into slavery, or because they were conquered, or I was re, uh, just telling the story to the older ones. Um, did you know, we, you know the missionary, one missionary that is given a public holiday to honor him? Who's that missionary? St. Patrick. Global holiday, St. Patrick, right? It's actually a ministry, a, a missionary to Ireland. He was born in Scotland. At 16 years old, raiders came into his village and kidnapped him and sold him as a slave in Ireland. And that was where he came to know, the, uh, really came to. He's a son of a deacon. Grandfather was a priest. And so it was there that he cried out to the Lord, Lord, you've got to save me. In the past, it, faith is just you know, like grow up in church kind. Okay, I, I just go to church. It's a rich, ritual. It's a religion. Well, not when you're in adversity. He cried out to God, God, you've got to save me. If you save me, I'm yours. And he gave his life to the Lord. And uh, you know, he, says, I, I'm, I'm, he said, I will be yours. He managed to escape. And he went back to Ireland. I mean, went back to Scotland. He honored his word, gave his life to serve the Lord, trained to be a pastor. And so he, you know, how Paul had a Macedonian call, he also had a very similar experience. In his vision, he saw an Irish man saying to him, Come over and evangelize Ireland. Now, in those days, Ireland was not Christian country. They were filled with those druids, superstitious people. They could kill you. Part Viking. Rough people. Hey, the people who kidnapped him, now God want to send him to, back to Ireland. That is a real uh, scary thought. You know what? He said he will serve the Lord. He will serve the Lord. See, it's not uh, what my preference is. I prefer young people. I prefer children ministry. See, our ideas of serving God is completely flawed. As in completely. A servant of God does not ask where they will be sent. It's, Lord, send me. Actually, sent to Ireland. Of course, the rest is history. He founded over 200 churches. Hundred thousands of people came to faith in Jesus through this one missionary called Patrick. And they made him a patron saint. That's why we have St. Patrick. Okay? This is before all the crazy hats and all the... You know, today is a chance to go to the pub and drink. This is all forgotten. It was a wonderful spiritual... You know, remembering this great... They owe it to him. He was a slave. Once. Right? Now, 
this is the idea. It's tough to be a slave. Now, along the way, there were slaves who came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the scriptures, the more famous one is Onesimus in the book of Philemon, where Paul wrote to Philemon and, and told his good friend Onesimus, please, oh, sorry, Philemon, please receive Onesimus. This was a slave, a runaway slave. And then he's changed. He's now become my son, from slave to spiritual son. Would you receive him? He used to be unprofitable. Most likely he stole money. Because if you read the Philemon, he, he, you know, Paul says, whatever he owes you, I will pay. But of course, Philemon is not going to. See, this is it. He's not going to take advantage. Paul's idea, you know, wonderful idea of friendship, he doesn't take advantage. Say, I will pay. You put it into my account. Right? Receive him. Most likely he ran away and he stole something. And then he ended up in prison. And in God's amazing grace, he met the Apostle Paul. Well, I say, captured. You can't go anywhere. You must hear the gospel every day. <laughs> he came to faith in Christ. Oh, that is a slave. So there are slaves who are Christians too. Right? But they will not be people who are wealthy. They will not be people who are influential. They may not be people who are... But can we minister to them? See, this is what I really appreciate about. This is what we must be as a church. They can be people from the lower echelon of society. Do we know how to reach out to them? I remember when I went to Launceston. Launceston is convict town, convict city. And the famous Port Arthur. This is where they have the historical uh, place. And all that. I remember going to... Uh, the, they have the first building they built, and it was a huge building in those days, was the church. Okay? The Christians were there. They would send the pastor there, the governor, they're all Christians. So they bring the convicts, all, let's put in Christian principles. You work hard, there's, redemp there, there's redemption. But if you carry on sinning, you will be chastised. Now what's really interesting, of course, convicts are all locked up, right? The only time of the week they can be among everyone else, as if they are freed, is in church. Would you believe this? I saw this. They built the church so the convicts can also attend worship. Special booths because they cannot, otherwise they run away. Isn't it? They cannot just go around the congregation. Part, congregation, ah, this is a convict, I'm sitting next to a convict. Cannot. They had special booths. But be, their views not block. But when they are there, although they are confined, confined, but when they are in the house of God, they are among brethren. That's incredible. And they actually thought about that. They actually built the church to cater for convicts. Not a special church just for convicts. The convicts can worship in the same house of God with free men and women. See, that's the kind of heart that Christians are to have. Not, okay, this person, wow, this person, and this person. This is you minister even to. And Paul instructed Timothy how to minister to those who are bond servants. They are not to be despised. They are to be cared for. Teach them how to live their faith in Christ. See, not just share the gospel, lead people to salvation, right? Salvation. That's the first step. But after that, what happened? The next step is vital. We need to help people how to live. How do we live for the Lord? And it doesn't matter which part of society you're from, what life you're 
circumstances, the principles you can live for the Lord, including bond servants. That's pretty amazing, exciting, thrilling to understand and appreciate this. Right? Take a look at this. And so he says uh, to Timothy, look, let as many bond servants, of course, the context here is they, are, they have become believers. Right? Under the yoke, count their own masters worthy of honour. That's interesting. How are they to regard their masters? Now, the first part of it must be understood as these are non-believing masters. Because there's a next part to it, believing masters. So that's where you've got to see the contrast. Now, non-believing masters are not going to be gracious. They are not going to respect your faith. How shall you regard those who are up there and they're not going to respect your faith? Interesting. And the word is, honour them. They are to be worthy of honour. Count their own masters worthy of all honour. Oh, that's interesting. Right? In other words, they are to have genuinely, you know, see, this is what it means, to, be, to have a conduct that is respectful. You respect them. You honour them. They could abuse you. Honour them. But you know, masters can be nasty. They could torture you. They could starve you. And there's no law because you belong to them. And they, if you break one of their house rules, they could kill you. How do you apply a principle? And the word honor them. Right? Now, watch. The word is so that. See, what is in the heart and mind of one who is a believer? What is in our heart and our mind when we live out our faith? What is it that is really in our heart and mind? Why do we want to live such a way? And Paul says, so that, this is the purpose. Remember, we talk about purpose. So that the name of God and His doctrine may not be blasphemed. This is why. Right? And people know you are a Christian. How do you live your life? And they look at you and they say, wow, this is a Christian. They blaspheme God. They blaspheme His teaching. And a lot of the time, Christians fail to live up to what is taught by God. Painfully. And so the name of God is blasphemed. The teachings of God is blasphemed. Because Christians do not live by the teachings of God's Word. Respectfully. See, the word is respect, honour. There is honour, you're an conduct, this is an honourable conduct. Okay, the word is actually honour, respect. Does that make, make sense to you? Okay, go ahead and raise up questions if you, if you want. Now, look at the flip, other side. Now, there are Christian masters. And those who have believing masters, how do you regard them? Let them not despise them. They could be in the same church. Don't despise them. How come don't despise them? See, sometimes, okay, because you know he's a Christian, I, I take it easier. You, you understand? You should understand. We all go to church on Sunday. We must have this. 
you almost end up taking advantage because you know the other person is a Christian. It's not the way to go. You honour them. You respect them. You don't take advantage. You don't be lazy. You don't want, this is what you should do. Rather, serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. How do you regard them? They are brethren, right? These are beloved, right? You know what? You serve them with love, respect, regard even more. That's a really wonderful principles to live by. This person is a Christian. Oh, okay, understanding. Relax, easy. Because, see, if this is a Christian out there, I'm more relaxed. Unfortunately, it's how we, we think we shouldn't. Okay, let's pray for a, a Christian uh, leader in the, in the government. If there's a Christian leader, life would be better. Not necessarily. Non-Christian, bad. Christian, good. It doesn't matter. Christian, non-Christian, you be respectful. You live honouring whoever leader is up there. Whatever master you are given, honour. This is Christian teaching. See, when we don't know the Lord's Word, we just assume, we go by our own wisdom and our own opinions, thinking, our own even human logic, thinking it's a better. That's why we need the Lord's Word so much more. Right? So if this, the Master is a believer, well, honour them. Don't despise them. Don't take advantage of them. Respect them. Serve hard, still be diligent, but even more that you, your service will benefit them and with love. They are beloved and they are brethren. Can they be brethren and yet you are still understand your position? I'm a slave. He's my master. But we can still call each other brethren? Exactly. See, brethren does not mean buddy or pal. You know, like, we are buddies. Okay, so when pastor writes uh, to us, dear brethren, I am not about to be on the same rank as his my buddy old pal. Of course not. <laughs> Even if we share the same title, pastors, okay, they have pastors, and, you know, out of love and respect, and of course, this is natural. We are children of God. Jesus is son. We are son. We are same rank. Uh, you, you may think that. I don't. I don't. He's, he is the son of God. You just privilege belong to the same family. Well, of course. This is not, not, not normal common sense. So brethren, yes. Beloved, yes. But I'm slave. This is my master. Do you see how, uh, how specific, how applicable, how relevant the Word of God, doctrine of God is applied to? And if we don't, less blaspheme. Blas God's name is blaspheme. God's teaching is blaspheme. If we've got to live by it. How we carry ourselves, how we conduct ourselves, everywhere, anywhere outside, that is vital. That's, that's what it is. So it's, not just, okay, I'm saved now. How do we live? At home, at work, at church, anywhere, everywhere. How do we live? And people will not, that know you are a Christian, they are not going to blaspheme the name of God or His teachings because of the way you live. Right? If we go and we are lazy and we are just angry, if we are people that shout here, shout there, then we are, you go to church, what do you learn in church? Because whatever you, it is, to be honest with you, for the longest time, 
I was so put off by Christianity because of this. I look at a lot of Christians, and I was so put off. If that is what it means to be a Christian, I did say this, I don't want to be a Christian. I didn't realize how wrong I was. Not all that we there are. This is what it was meant. I didn't know the Lord's word. We must honor the Lord, His name, and His teaching by the way we live. So in everything, literally everything, outside in the world, before I serve the Lord full time, when there is a meeting on, I'm there early, half an hour early. Not, not church meeting, outside meeting. I'm prepared, raring to go. You'll be the most ready person there. If a person knows you're a Christian and you are the least ready, <laughs> it's a laughing stock. You'll be. You live by it. The way you serve, the way you honour, whatever it is. Okay, look at this, right? Now, this is vital. Look at how, and then he tells them, teach and exhort these things. These things must be taught. Now, we don't have the actual, what was taught? Okay, now, we're going to take a look at the book of Ephesians as well, because Paul ministered directly to those who are bond servants too. Here, he's teaching Timothy to do it, right? But he taught this. Teach and exhort these things. What are these things? Okay, now let's, let's take a look at uh, these things. In Ephesians 6, okay, to begin with, there are two texts. One is found in Ephesians and the other is Colossians. And they are very close by, these churches. Okay, so it is similar, but each one has its values. Right Now, Ephesians 6, we see this in verse 5. He uh, ministers directly to those who are bond servants. He says, bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh. And that is the most basic thing. Be obedient. Right? See, our Christian sense of obedience to God spills over in the way we do things. Obedience. We understand this is how we live and apply truths. Be obedient. Are there slaves that were disobedient? Yes. And you are a Christian slave. You're different. See, once upon a time, Onassimus, unprofitable. He's changed. Paul would have taught him what it means to be a believer. You're a slave, but you be a believer. Now, look how specific. Be obedient with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart, genuine in other words, as to Christ. You do this as to Christ. This is how you can live for the Lord Jesus Christ every day. It's not at church only that we serve. We serve the Lord every day. How? By being obedient. By being sincere. Right? Not with eye service. Uh, as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ. Now, he's the one who coined this phrase, bond servant of Christ. Right? So you're not just bond servants. This is literal to this master, but you are a servant of the Lord. In other words, in fact, he used this term to, with reference to himself. I'm a bond servant of Christ. Right? It is not something that is low. Okay? And he says, doing the will of God from the heart. You mean you can do the will of God as a bond servant, as a slave? Yes. See, we often think, okay, God, you know, the greater things of God, you, 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 serving God, 
in this area, in this area, then you're doing the will of God. Not necessarily. You can do the will of God right where you are. Every day too. As a bond servant, yes. Because if you do this, you are doing the will of God from your heart. It's a question of whether we're doing the will of God or we're not doing the will of God. We think doing the will of God is, okay, I'm in church, I'm serving here, I'm serving there, I'm doing the will of God. But I'm, when I'm outside in my work, I'm not doing the will of God. Not true. Because you can be right at church and you're not doing the will of God. You're doing your own will. You're serving your own way. Not obedient to the Lord either. You want to do your own thing. Doesn't mean you're doing the will of God. The will of God done is out of an obedient heart. You do God's work, God's way, not your own way. You'll be doing the will of God everywhere. Has God called me to do this? Zingyi, has God called you to care for people out there? Care. It's not just translation work. Wherever you, every day, to me, it would be, it's so, so thrilling to know every day you go to work, you can do the will of God. As a slave, <laughs> I mean, none of your house are slaves, okay? If you complain about your job, this one, don't even get paid. You get abused. Where got workers come? You get injured too bad. What really, you know what? I'm doing the will of God. Wow. Have you seen a happy slave? A Christian slave. Have you seen a happy worker? A Christian worker. Because in their heart, in their mind, they're not just doing this work. No matter how mundane, how awful the work is, they are doing the will of God. Their heart is in the right place. Look at that. Look at, take a look at this. This is how we apply faith, right? Banks, as a student, can I be doing the will of God? Yes. Isn't that one exciting and wonderful? You mean going to school can be doing the will of God? Yes, if you can understand it like that. You know what? I want to do it right. I want to go in and say, well, I want to do it as, as one who is a Christian. Be a Christian student. That's exciting, hardworking, diligent, right? Respectful. This is something we teach our children. You go to school, it's not just about learning. You learn to respect your teachers. You respect those who are you know, teaching you, guiding you. The teachers may not teach that, but we as Christians will teach it. Of course. Right? I was reading a text, Proverbs 20, 20. Okay? The person who curse their father and mother, their lamp will be put into deep darkness. <laughs> what is that proverb all about? Teach. Warn. Do not be respectful. Disrespectful to your parents. That is a very strong warning from the Lord. Not only you will be in darkness, you will be in deep darkness. Well, good for you. Joe, you want to fly all the way to Hong Kong to celebrate Mother's Day, but Mother's Birthday on Friday? Good. Honor. Is this Christian? Absolutely. 90-year-old mum deserves to be honored. Okay, so this is wonderful. Okay, so we apply this. Are we doing the will of God? Yes! Look at this. You will be doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, doing service as to the Lord. You're serving God. That's what it is. Not to men. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord. Whether he is slave or free, it doesn't matter. This you do, you do it to the Lord. Wow.
That's, that was my work ethics, literally, when I went out to work. That's why I'm early. I'm early at church, I'm early at work. Oh, at work, this is not a church. I disregard people, disregard the boss, disregard what I slack off. Then I'm a hypocrite. I truly am. One life. I do all things as to the Lord. All things. Every day. Everywhere. It's the way I rep- uh, approach things. is the way I regard this. Anyway. All the time. Right? Wherever you are. So I was explaining to a father because I brought James to a birthday. I had to leave church after the class and all that on Sunday because we need to bring him to a birthday party that started at 3 o'clock, but it was in Jundalup. So I drive down there and then uh, you know, the kids get to play and then the fathers sit down and talk. So one of the fathers uh, said, so what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor. I said, I have no idea what that is. Can you please tell me? I said, sure. So I explained the kind of things that we do. They said, wow. And I said, look, it's my privilege. I said, sure is. Such honor to be a servant of the Lord. The thing we are tempting, the work, things we work with. And so, uh, you know, at the family camp that passed, uh, we invited uh, one of James' classmates. His name was Sohan. And he went back home and he couldn't stop telling his parents about the camp, as in couldn't stop. He said, my son does not come home and talk about the school like this. What you are all doing is so wonderful. He said, next year, I, I'm going to put my son there. That's how you sow a seed. It's why we keep on pushing. Serve, let's, let's, let's improve. Let's do this because we honour the name of the Lord. Of course. The, from the smallest detail to... You think it's just message? It's the whole camp experience. From the kitchen to the service this is why over the next few months we're revamping all areas of service as in the entire church. I'll be leading it. How do we serve better? Every area. Because it's the whole thing. It's not just meeting the teachers. It's been, I will still continue to meet with them every month. But now, from ushering to service all across board, because it is the whole thing. How? From the Lord's Word, of course. How do we apply it? See, this is how we apply it. Whatever good, do a good work. Don't just do a work, do a good work. If this is no good, out. And so Howard Schutz said to his barristers, now, this is when they were making, they were making loss. In 2008, Starbucks shares was plummeting. They almost went into bankruptcy. And so he took over as CEO, and he literally saved Starbucks. Saved. You know what he did? He literally told them, we have lost service. We have lost our vision. We have lost the plot. We used to care for every coffee we made. We used to care for people. Now it is just, okay, quickly, it is money. Just making money. Just trying to save on money. And the more you do that, the worse it is. And so he told all who made coffee, all his barristers, if that cup of coffee is not perfect, I give you the permission. You tip it out, you make a new cup until it's perfect. Wow, it's going to waste a lot of money? Yes, perfect it. If a secular company knows how to serve, how come the church, anything goes? Never mind, it's burnt. Never mind, just let them eat. Seriously? 
As long as you've got food to eat, stop complaining. What are you talking about? Do you see the difference? It's your heart. You do this unto the Lord. That is why this lady called Mary was honoured by the Lord when she gave her pound of nard. She gave something of worth. Do you know what that worth was? It is not the expensive nard. It was her heart. Her heart of love. That to the Lord is worth everything. To a Judas, it is wow, so expensive. Why you give this? He could have used to feed the poor as if he cares. It's a heart of love. Every time we serve, we offer, we do it with a heart of love. Every meal we prepare, we must prepare with a heart of love or stop it. You only dishonor yourself and worse, the Lord's name and His teaching. That's what I mean. Don't think, just because, okay, I'm serving in the church, I'm doing the will of God. Doesn't work like that. It's your heart. That's what Paul is teaching. It's your heart. Do a good work. If whatever good anyone does, he will receive from the Lord. The Lord will honour you. Please, do a good work. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, we're going to turn to that. The other side, he also addressed the masters. Masters do the same thing, giving up threatening, knowing your own masters in heaven. Of course, these are Christian masters. Okay? No partiality with him. Right now, let's turn to Colossians. Okay, now in Colossians 3, 22. Again, addressing bond servants. Right? Now, bond servants, similar, obey in all things your master. Right? Again, obedience, according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men pleaser, but in sincerity of heart. Now, fearing God. We should serve the Lord fearing God. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to man. That's how we should serve. We do it heartily unto the Lord. Not just to men, but to the Lord. As if the Lord is the one who will receive it. How would you cook? How would you clean? How would you prepare your teaching? if the Lord was the one who will receive what you give, I think you prepare quite differently. But in your mind, oh, is these people, you know, these, whether it's young people or children or old people, and you stop caring, then you miss the point. I go and see what calf eats. He says, I, this, I can't stand the food. Take Kathy, you've got to try, you've got to try. I, I can say that easily. Until one day I brought her to her mealtime, I saw it. I never said anything again. <laughs> try. You've really got to try. Because I look, it's just mash everything. Mash this, I don't know. I can't work out whether that is meat or vegetable. <sighs> that is painful. There is no love. In that meal preparation, is nah. it is to eat, to live, so you don't die. That's it. It is not because wow, the, the chef behind is preparing something to honour the person, to we got to love the person. Out there in the world, they won't do that unless it's for 
some sort of reward, right? Like Master Chef. Whoa, prepare for the three fat guys. Wow, look at the food. It's, even if it's just chicken wing, it's plated up. <sighs> Who are you preparing for? The Lord? And you would want to honour it, don't you? You do it heartily, won't you? You do it with joy, won't you? You do it with love, won't you? That's how we were meant to serve. That's how we were meant to work. Do it unto the Lord. So every patient you see, Garrett, wow, I'm caring for the Lord. Differently. I'm doing this for the Lord. Differently. This is so much wonderful. The purpose, the zeal, the joy you will have every day. This is why I do not need anyone to watch over me to do my work. Because you practice this. You do it with joy. Right? So late into the night, still... Thinking, answering, email, whatever, preparing, planning, lots to be done. Now, the physical side of the church too. So, getting quotes for painting, skirting, other things. Just need to do it. Need to look into it, but with joy. Why learn things? Otherwise, never learn. Right? Learn a lot of things, aircon, all kinds of things. Well, you're going to do it and do it with joy. Do it unto the Lord. Look at that. That is a wonderful thing to uh, uh, apply, isn't it? Not as man pleases, not as I. No need anyone watching, then you work hard. <laughs> In church, during the week, nobody's there watching. Nobody needs to. You know what? Because you are motivated. You, what? The Lord is something you want to do this for. Knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. Don't you? Every day you serve the Lord Christ. You think you're serving man? You think it's just your master? You are serving the Lord. Now, this is... For a slave, you know. And we are not working for masters and we are not slaves. We are, have far better conditions. And if we get an opportunity to serve the Lord in church, is it not a privilege? So I told this young father, you know, uh, this person, I said, look, this was my background, this is what I was planning, and you know what? I chose a something that I felt that would really make an impact in my own life and the life of others. I chose to be a pastor. And he says, wow, that is a privilege. I said, you're right, it is a privilege. And it's a privilege I don't take for granted. That's what li you live each day with a great sense of privilege. Not entitlement, privilege. Not the same. Feeling entitled is terrible. Yeah I, yeah, I deserve this. I deserve this. I don't. I don't deserve any of it. None of this. Privilege. That's what it is. You serve the Lord Christ. Isn't that special? Right? This is how we are to apply. So you watch when Paul says to Timothy, Teach and exhort these things. He has been doing that. These are the principles. T now, Timothy, learn them. Teach them. Teach them how to live for the Lord. Teach them how to do the will of God. Teach them what it means to be a servant of the Lord. These are applicable to us too, even though we are not slaves. They are not just for slaves. He said, whether slaves or free, we are free. Let's do it. That's, a, that's the wonderful challenge. Right? Now, verse 25, there is a... Uh, 
this part of it must be also red. Okay? This is the other side. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has does. There is no partiality. Now, what is this? You can be a Christian, you can be have this, and then you do that which is wrong and sinful. God will repay you too. There is no partiality with God. I'm a Christian. There's no partiality with God. Right? He will not bless you. That's, what, that's why we've been. It's not about position. That means, oh, I can, I, I'm serving in church, you know, I'm doing God's work, you know, I can do whatever I want and God will bless anyway. Not true. You don't do it God's way. You're going to dishonor the name of God. You're going to bring blasphemy to His teaching. God is not, does, is not partial. He is not going to bless you. He will chastise you. That's what it is. It's the other side. He will reward good and faithful servant. This one, not good and faithful, rebellious, sinful, he will chastise. The Lord is the ultimate master. This is why with all who are teachers in, in my Sunday school teachers, uh, whether they're, I, I, I'm very firm with them in the way they regard the Lord and His Word and His work. I must, I must warn them. The rebuke must come if it's wrong. Because I fear for them. If they don't, the Lord will chastise. Right? Obviously. This is why, with, with this in mind, I, I have to correct. I have to help them to see, look, this is the way to go, not this. Turn. Turn back to the Lord. Same principles here. Right? Now, this is not teachers. This is slaves. This is lower end. Right? These are people who could be rough. Or because they're rough, they don't understand anything. They do whatever they want. That's not true. You teach a person to live for the Lord anyway, wherever circumstance of life they are in. Right? These are uneducated people. They don't know better. Ignorance is not bliss. Can you, even if you don't have the best of education, even if you're not a person in position, you are the opposite end, as low as slaves, can you still do the will of God? Can you still serve the Lord Christ? And will the Lord bless you? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Isn't that exciting? That's why we teach people, we help people. That's what we want to do. One, lead them to Christ. Lead people to the Lord. Two, help people. This is what we need. More of you to be equipped like this in your own life first. Because if we're not living for the Lord, if we're not doing it, we have no business. We can't even tell it to others. We have to do this first. Right? And then help other people live for the Lord. Right? Because we do it every day. Every day we can, the will of God can be done. Every day we can find a great sense of privilege. I'm serving the Lord. Yes. All right. Any questions you want to raise up over here? To me, this is just so enlightening. really is. You go to read Ephesians, you go to read Colossians, you look at 1 Timothy 6, and you put it all together, and then you begin to understand and appreciate how we can live for the Lord every single day. But on the flip side, if we don't, if we behave sinfully, we're going to end up bringing blasphemy. To me, my greatest horror and fear is if I bring blasphemy to the name of God and to His teachings. 
That's my greatest fear. Because that is the one thing I do not want to do. How can you bring blasphemy to the one you love? Right? right? Doesn't make any sense. Okay? So this, this is just really good. Lord, just want to do this. Teach me. This is where teach me is vital. I don't know. Teach me. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to change the way I do things. Right? Sincere heart. Not half-hearted. In anything I do, especially if I'm given a place to serve in church, especially out there, just as well. In the church, if I dishonor the Lord like this, how can I face Him? Right? So when I go and speak at the aged care, I wear a jacket. And so one, one person said, wow, you dress well. Yeah, I said I'm good at the HK. One, because I represent the Lord. Two, right? When I dress up to, to minister to people, the, for, especially for the older ones, they know you dressed up for it. They feel special. You mean you dress up for me? Yes. But we're just a small group of old people here. I dress up for you too. It just tells me, to me, you mean a lot. You are special. That's what it is. That's why even the physical is important. Of course it is. Every part. Oh, I tell our future leaders, I say, okay, we've got to improve in the way you dress if you serve in communion. You must. Of course. Learn to dress well. Learn to represent well. Right? Okay. In your workplace, I hope you know you, right? You, there's dress code, right? Cannot, uh, tomorrow, is there some form of dress code? You cannot come in t shirts and shorts, right? No matter how hot that day is. <laughs> Not allowed to wear jeans. Here we go. At, at least, exactly. If a school has basic dress codes, how come those who serve the Lord got nothing? Whatever feel comfortable to you. It's not about personal comfort. See, it's not about yourself. It's about the Lord. It's about serving. You represent well. Okay? So, suit is no problem here. But try Singapore. Wow, that was tough. When I was in Singapore in full suit. Oh, and then did a lawn burial oh, outside at Singapore where that was when I think my sweat glands just broke. And ever since then, I have no problem wearing suit in Singapore. When I first went, I couldn't. I couldn't wear a shirt and tie in Singapore humid weather. I was just sweating nonstop. And they look at me, this foreigner, this felt for me. And, so, and then three months into, I just couldn't, could not wear a suit. How can it? Ah, I'll just stay in the sanctuary. I think the lawn burial did me in. And that was when, hey, I climatized. Now it's just everywhere, no problem. See, it's not personal comfort. It isn't. It is not why you do that, but you know, it is, it's, you do this because it rep, you, it's who you represent. The Lord. Okay? Right, any questions you want to raise up on, on this matter? I hope this, yeah, to me, this is just such a thrilling study to see this. Now, this is slaves, you know. Of course, Paul addresses the fathers, the mothers, but we say, oh, principle, is the Lord's word relevant for all? Yes, live for Him. How shall we be serving the Lord? That's how we should study the Lord's word, that we may serve God better in our everyday life. Not just at church, if you have a ministry here, but every day. How can I serve God better? How can I be doing His will? How can I, in a way that would honour Him? You do it heartily. You do it to the Lord. This is what I want to bring to all who are serving in the kitchen, in the server, in the ushering, in the traffic marshal, in washing too. Yes. 
Huh? Even then, yes, see, the idea, not that they are slaves, okay? They are far from slaves. They are anything but slaves. Okay? It is more privileged, but see the principles applied? Wow, I want to do it like that. Yes. There's a great sense of ownership and joy and love in if we do this. You're going to see a wonderful, happy spirit of service in the church. But if everybody wants to do their own thing, you're going to have a nightmare. Right? Okay, well, we've got to pray. Begin here. Begin with you. You're here. You heard. Apply it. Apply it. Okay, now, those who are recording, please, no, the recording, same thing. Apply all that you record and record well. Do a good job. I was asked questions about the morning sessions for the camp, so I had to listen to some of the messages, go back to it, because I was teaching in a class. I wasn't in the pastor's session, so I listened to some of them to answer questions. And um, some of the recording, uh, you have to really turn up the volume to listen. Can we record in such a way you don't have to? Because once the thing goes, the, re the thing blasts and I almost went deaf. Okay? because I cranked it to 50 to listen to the message. And then after it's over, ah, almost blew my eardrum. Okay, I'm just thinking maybe those who are overseas, the older people, they already got so few hearing left. You, we don't want to be the one guilty of the, giving them the final blow. Can we record much better? Can? Right? That they, you know, just bear those things with my ear. Everything you do, do it well. Okay, please do it well. So I never check because I don't, I don't listen to my own messages for obvious reasons. Okay, yeah, I can answer the question. Okay, if, if people ask me, hey, you spoke on this, okay, I, excuse me, can I check my own message? What did I say? I'll be, I will be in trouble. Okay? But if you ask me questions from what Pastor Charlie, first you should just ask him. If, but if you do, I have to listen to it too. Okay, go through it. So that I listened to it and then I almost went deaf. Okay, so just bear that in mind. Can we, we do things? Yeah, let's improve. Do it unto the Lord. That would be wonderful. Okay? All right? If not, practice. No question. I, I, I take it that you, wow, I understand it. As if. <laughs> okay? Let's practice it. See, obedience. You know what? Obedience is to the Lord. I'm going to do it. I'm going to obey the Lord. I fear the Lord. I love the Lord. I want to do this for the Lord. I want to do His will. But of course, naturally so. Okay? Well, let's pray together. Our Father, we just thank You for Your Word. And we pray that we would truly be better servants of Yours. Forgive us where we serve out of ignorance, where we serve out of our own understanding, presumptuousness, and even our own ways, thinking we're serving you. We pray that you would wash and cleanse us. Give to us a renewed understanding of how we are meant to serve you that would honor your name. May we not be guilty of bringing blasphemy to your name and to your teaching. May we honor it in the way we would live by it bringing honor to your word, to your name. We ask that you would bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you.